Hello, welcome my friends and colleagues in new video of our YouTube channel. Number 1 Doctor, today we'll have a lecture. Hope you enjoy, get benefits. But before we start the lecture, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel Number 1 Doctor. Like the video, share the video on social media. Follow us on our social accounts below the description. If you have any ideas, leave it in comments below the video. Okay Doctor, can we start the lecture now? Okay, we will start soon. Hello. Today I will talk about sigmoid volvulus. Okay, doctor can we start? Volvulus refers to torsion of a segment of the alimentary tract, which often leads to bowel obstruction. The most common sites of volvulus are the sigmoid colon and scum. Volvulus of other portions of the alimentary tract, such as the stomach, gallbladder, small bowel, splenic flexure, and transverse colon, are rare. The diagnosis and treatment of sigmoid volvulus will be reviewed here. What about the epidemiology of sigmoid volvulus? Volvulus of the sigmoid colon represents approximately 40 to 70 percent of colonic volvulus depending upon the age of patients and the geographic location of the series. In one report of 137 patients with colonic volvulus seen at the Mayo Clinic, for example, the following colonic segments were involved. Scum 52%, sigmoid 43%, transverse colon 3%, splenic flexure 2%. The precise incidence of sigmoid volvulus in the population is not well established, and its prevalence among patients who present with acute intestinal obstruction varies geographically. In the United States, sigmoid volvulus is a relatively uncommon cause of intestinal obstruction representing fewer than 10% of cases in most series. In contrast, for unclear reasons, the prevalence is much higher in other parts of the world. As an example, sigmoid volvulus was responsible in 80% of cases of intestinal obstruction from the Bolivian and Peruvian Andes and 50% of cases of large bowel obstruction in Nigeria. The incidence may also be increased in Brazil, where it may be a complication of megacolon caused by Chagas disease. What are the risk factors? Anatomic features predisposing to sigmoid volvulus include a redundant sigmoid colon that has a narrow mesenteric attachment. Although a number of risk factors associated with sigmoid volvulus can be explained by these anatomic considerations, the precise pathogenesis underlying sigmoid torsion has not been well established. In most series, sigmoid volvulus occurred in elderly patients, often those who are institutionalized and debilitated with neurologic and psychiatric conditions such as Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. In a report from England of 40 patients, the average age was 72, 40% 40 lived in nursing homes or institutions. By contrast, the mean age was 58 in a report from Turkey of 688 patients with sigmoid volvulus. The reasons why sigmoid volvulus is more common with advancing age are not well understood. Lengthening of the sigmoid colon and its mesentery is not a feature of normal aging. One possible explanation is colonic dysmotility, which could predispose to torsion of the sigmoid colon. Support for an underlying motility problem was provided in one series of 58 patients with colonic volvulus in whom a large bowel motility disturbance was observed in 9 of 20 patients, 45% following surgery. Presumably, motility disorders were also present in some of these patients prior to surgery. In addition, prolonged transit of stool through the sigmoid colon and rectum has been observed in frail elderly patients who are constipated. Sigmoid volvulus can also occur in younger patients and in children, in whom the diagnosis may be delayed due to the atypical age of presentation and the intermittent nature of symptoms. In children, sigmoid volvulus can be the initial presenting feature of Hirschsprung's disease. An organglionic segment below the sigmoid colon and a freely mobile mesozygmoid may be responsible in this setting. Sigmoid volvulus has occurred in a number of other settings including Crohn's disease, pregnancy, Chagas disease, and colonic hypertrophy associated with a high-fiber diet. In some series, the disease was more common in men, but others have reported equal gender frequency. A variant of sigmoid volvulus, aleosigmoid knotting, occurs when the ileum wraps itself around the sigmoid. The most common type occurs when the ileum encircles the sigmoid colon in a clockwise manner. Laxity of the allele and sigmoid mesentery may predispose to this condition. What are the clinical manifestations and diagnosis? The majority of patients with sigmoid volvulus present with abdominal pain, nausea, abdominal distension, and constipation, vomiting is less common. However, some patients, particularly younger patients, may have a more insidious presentation with recurrent attacks of abdominal pain, with resolution presumably due to spontaneous detition. 
The disease may not be as apparent in the frail elderly or in patients with neurologic diseases who are unable to express their complaints. A retrospective series from Turkey described clinical features in 859 patients with sigmoid volvulus. The mean age of the patients was 58 years, 83% were men and 9% had a prior history of sigmoid volvulus. The most common clinical features were abdominal pain and tenderness 99%, distension 96%, and obstipation 92%. Plain abdominal x-rays revealed evidence of sigmoid volvulus in 65% of the patients. CT scan, MRI, and sigmoidoscopy were used to establish the diagnosis in other patients. Compromise of the blood supply to the sigmoid colon can lead to gangrene with resulting peritonitis and sepsis. Fortunately, the majority of patients come to medical attention prior to the development of gangrene. As an example, in one series of 54 patients with sigmoid volvulus, only 4-7% presented with gangrene. However, gangrene may not be suspected in its early stages based upon the physical examination and laboratory findings, and can develop rapidly in patients in whom the volvulus is not corrected. The diagnosis is often suspected based upon the clinical presentation and physical examination. The pain associated with sigmoid volvulus is usually continuous and severe, with a superimposed colicky component occurring during peristalsis. The abdomen is usually distended and tympanitic. A plain film of the abdomen can establish the diagnosis in approximately 60% of patients. The distended sigmoid colon appears as an ahostral collection of gas, sometimes referred to as a bent inner tube, that extends from the pelvis to the right upper quadrant as high as the diaphragm. Distended large bowel proximal to the sigmoid and air fluid levels in the small bowel are often present. A barium enema using water-soluble contrast may be helpful in uncertain cases. The diagnosis can also be made by CT scan. Typical findings include a world pattern caused by the dilated sigmoid colon around its mesocolon and vessels, and a bird beak appearance of the afferent and efferent colonic segments. These classic imaging features are not uniformly seen, and other CT findings have also been described. What is the treatment of sigmoid volvulus? The goals of treatment of sigmoid volvulus are to prevent the development of gangrene and to address the anatomic abnormality that led to the volvulus. An effective way to restore the blood supply to the colon is to detoss the volvulus, which can be accomplished by advancing a flexible or rigid sigmoidoscope through the twisted segment. An additional advantage of sigmoidoscopy is assessment of the viability of the colon. The procedure should be immediately stopped to prevent bowel perforation if the mucosa appears gangrenous. Furthermore, sigmoidoscopy should not be performed in patients who are likely to have already developed intestinal gangrene, such as those with sepsis, fever, or peritonitis. The area of twisting is usually evident within 25 cm of the anal verge. A spiral, sphincter-like area of mucosa will be encountered at the area of torsion. Gentle pressure with minimal insufflation will permit advancement of the sigmoidoscope, causing straightening of the sigmoid colon. A dilated segment proximal to the sigmoid colon filled with gas and stool or a sudden expulsion of gas indicates successful reduction of the volvulus. Gas and fluid should be suctioned prior to withdrawal of the instrument. The mucosa should be carefully inspected for evidence of bowel ischemia. Counterclockwise twisting of the sigmoidoscope during withdrawal is probably not necessary since straightening of the sigmoid colon occurs during advancement. Many endoscopists choose to leave a rectal tube in place with its proximal end beyond the area of twisting. The advantage of a rectal tube compared to sigmoidoscopic decompression without a rectal tube has not been well established. However, a rectal tube may lessen colonic distension and reduce the chance of recurrent volvulus in the acute setting. Reduction of the sigmoid volvulus using this technique has been successful in 85-95% to of cases in some series. The major problem is recurrence in up to 60% of patients. The time to recurrence can vary from hours to weeks. As a result, definitive treatment soon after sigmoidoscopic reduction is advised. Initial sigmoidoscopic reduction of the volvulus converts an emergency procedure into a semi-urgent procedure with ample time for bowel preparation and preoperative care. Although surgical resection without decompression has been used at some centers with acceptable outcomes, we favor preoperative decompression whenever feasible. The surgical approaches to prevent recurrent volvulus include mesozygmoidopexy in resection with primary anastomosis or a Hartmann's procedure. Sigmoid resection with primary anastomosis has been associated with the greatest success in patients who have not developed gangrene. 
Surgery can usually be performed through a small left lower quadrant transverse incision, since the elongated bowel and mesentery easily protrude outside of the abdomen. A cutaneous endoscopic colostomy has been described in case series but has been associated with significant morbidity. The mortality related to sigmoid volvulus is highest, 11 to 60 percent in various series, in patients who have developed gangrene. In contrast, the mortality is less than 10 percent in patients treated by surgical resection who have not developed gangrene. These numbers compare to the unlikely occurrence of death in patients without gangrene following successful sigmoidoscopic reduction. This observation has led some authorities to argue that surgery should be reserved for patients in whom sigmoidoscopic reduction is unsuccessful since as many as 40 to 50 percent of these patients will not have a recurrence. However, no reliable criteria can predict recurrence, and some patients may have already developed gangrene unsuspected on sigmoidoscopy. Thus, this conservative approach should be reserved for patients in whom definitive surgical therapy is considered to be associated with prohibitive risks. Please doctor, can you summarize your lecture and tell us what are the recommendations? Volvulus refers to torsion of a segment of the alimentary tract, which often leads to bowel obstruction. The most common sites of volvulus are the sigmoid colon and scum. Anatomic features predisposing to sigmoid volvulus include a redundant sigmoid colon that has a narrow mesenteric attachment but the precise pathogenesis underlying sigmoid torsion has not been well established. The majority of patients with sigmoid volvulus present with abdominal pain, nausea, abdominal distension, and constipation, vomiting is less common. However, some patients, particularly younger patients, may have a more insidious presentation with recurrent attacks of abdominal pain, with resolution presumably due to spontaneous detition. A plain film of the abdomen can establish the diagnosis in approximately 60% of patients. The diagnosis can also be made by CT scan. The goals of treatment of sigmoid volvulus are to prevent the development of gangrene and to address the anatomic abnormality that led to the volvulus. In patients who do not have clinical features suggestive of gangrene or perforation, we suggest flexible sigmoidoscopy in an attempt to detoss the twisted segment, grade 2b. Following successful datation, we suggest leaving a rectal tube in place, grade 2c. Recurrent volvulus develops in about 50-60% to 60 of patients. As a result, we suggest surgery to prevent recurrence, grade 2c. We generally perform a mechanical bowel preparation and then a standard open laparotomy with sigmoid resection and primary anastomosis. Exceptions are patients in whom definitive surgical therapy is considered to be associated with prohibitive risks. Thank you Dr. Atf Ahmad for your excellent presentation. Thanks for all. Hope all enjoyed the lecture. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again in next lectures and presentations. Do not forget to share and like the video. With my best wishes. Dr. Atf Ahmad and visit my website. Dr. Atf.net <laughs>